<clears throat> All right. Oh, we already got some people coming in. Good morning or good afternoon, wherever you are. Uh, as you come in, why don't you drop us a note in the chat and let us know uh, where you're coming from and what role you fill on your team. Or maybe a chat just if you can hear me, just because uh, <laughs> don't want to don't want to be talking to no one. All right, people can hear, people are hearing. Wonderful, we got some pre-sales manager, senior engineering leader, uh, senior manager pre-sales enablement from Los uh, from Los Angeles. Robert, I'm a Los Angeles native myself, living in Salt Lake now, but, you know, grew up in Whittier, pre-sales leader in New Jersey, home of the boss, recruiter near Cincinnati. Awesome. Well, we'll give it like another minute and then we'll get started here. I'm really excited to have you all. So I'll get ready to share my screen and then we'll turn it over for Amanda. All right, so we welcome you guys all to uh, the Scaling Presales webinar presented by Consensus. This is hiring presales, the struggles and challenges of finding talented SEs with uh, our good friend Amanda Bertucci. She's from ArcSurf. She's a presales team lead over in MIA there. Um, my name is Garrett Erickson. I'm a marketing manager here at Consensus. I've been here for almost a year now, loving it. And I'll be hosting and taking your questions and uh, handling some of the, the back end stuff here. Uh, just as a by way of announcement and just housekeeping, we've got a couple of groups that you guys can join if you guys want to. I'll post the links to them here, but you know, we post regular content on our LinkedIn page. So if you're not following consensus on LinkedIn, go ahead and give us that and, and we'll interact with you there. We also have the scaling pre-sales LinkedIn group. I'll post the link uh, here in the chat to join that group. Um, where you can interact with more le thought leaders like Amanda and, and others who regularly post in there. So um, if you haven't joined there, I'll post that link and you guys can join and, and we'll you know get you get you going there. But on to the main event. So this is why you're all here. This is such a great topic. We're so excited to have Amanda with us. Um, Amanda has presented at Demo Fest in the past and we've worked with her in a couple other areas. And she's been in the IT industry for over 20 years. Um, she's you know, spent approximately 15 of those years in pre-sales, and uh, she's worked in various countries in Latin America and uh, is currently in Barcelona, where she manages ArcServe's uh, inside pre-sales team for EMEA. So she's, you know, doing a great job there, and she's uh, actually one of the leaders for the Spain chapter of Pre-Sales Collective uh, and building and maintaining a lot of those relationships here. And, and just in talking before this, found out that Amanda speaks like a million languages. So she's, you know, just su super cultured, person. And so we're so excited to have her. Uh, with that, I'll stop my share and uh, turn it over to you, Amanda. Thank you so much, uh, Garrett. And thank you for the, the introduction. The introduction really good. Um, well, uh, welcome, everybody. I'm very excited to be here with you today, um, talking about this topic that is so important nowadays, hiring pre-sales, right? So it is a struggle, it's a big challenge. And I want to share with you some of my, my experience and, and my, uh, you know, how uh, I do it over here in EMEA to, to find talented SEs, all right? So, um, well, I was gonna say a little bit about myself, but uh, I think that Garrett pretty much covered it. Um, so if you want to scan the QR code, you're gonna end up in my LinkedIn profile and please feel free to add me there and continue the conversation after the session. Um, like uh, uh, Garrett said, I'm based out of Barcelona. I'm originally from Brazil, been living in Europe for three and a half years now. Um, 20 years uh, working in the IT industry. I started when I was very young and um, pre-sales is uh, my passion. Um, I've been uh, doing pre-sales for a very long time. Um, like Garrett said, I'm part of the pre-sales collective as well. For those of you who don't know, it's the largest um, 
global pre-sales community. Uh, I'm one of the, the co-founders and leaders of the Spain chapter. Uh, so if you're based in Spain and you want to join us, uh, please do. We're always happy to welcome more people in the community. Um, I'm also certified I Am Remarkable facilitator. I Am Remarkable is an initiative for Google, um, no, from Google for uh, people, uh, women and, and other people uh, from minorized groups to, uh, you know, practice um, self-promotion in the workplace. So it's, it's a very interesting initiative. If you're into uh, DEI, uh, it, it's worth taking a look at it. Um, so I'm, I'm very happy to be here today. Um, so let's get, get to it. Um, the topics I'm going to cover today are, uh, first of all, why hire? Why are you looking into hiring someone? Uh, how do you, uh, how is your team set up today? Uh, what is your motivation behind it? There are some things before you do that, that I think you should take a look at before you go look for more people in the market. Um, the second topic I want to cover is the great resignation of 2021. And this is actually uh, an expression we have been seeing a lot in the market today. Everywhere uh, I, I look, every time I log into LinkedIn, I see somebody talking about the great, the great resignation. And it's a very relevant topic today. We're going to cover a little bit of it. Um, the third thing I want to talk to you about is becoming attractive and retaining talent. So it's not just about bringing more people into your team, but you know, preventing people from leaving your company. Um, so how do you do that? Um, and you know, the, the last two topics are where to find talent, where should you go uh, you know, if you're not finding the talent that you need, and what I usually look for when I'm hiring SEs. Uh, what are the skills that I look for? Uh, what are the most important things that I think an SE should have to be part of my team? So um, I hope this um, helps you, uh, you know, uh, uh, have some ideas and, and get some enlightenment in terms of uh, this you know, interesting moment we're at uh, right now. So let's get to it. First of all, why hire, right? Um, why should you be looking for other people? What are your motivations? It's really important that you start with a very well-defined purpose and goal. Um, there are many reasons why you should be hiring, but before you go to that, just take a look at your current team, right? Uh, look at what your team is doing. Look at uh, you know what your team is capable of doing. Make sure that your processes are streamlined, and that your team is being efficient and working at the you know the best of its capacity. Um, you might be wanting to uh, hire to close a demand gap, right? But uh, maybe there are other strategies that you can use to make your team a little bit more efficient before you go to the market looking for more people. Um, one of the, the suggestions that we have there, it's a given uh, everyone, have you looked at demo automation tools, right? Uh, Pre-sales automation is one of the highest topics at the moment for pre-sales as well. Consensus uh, does it very well. Um, and they can definitely help you, uh, you know, uh, uh, make your pre-sales teams more efficient, right? So it's worth taking a look at why do you have this demand gap and how can you automate some of the things so you can take advantage of the resources that you have so you can make your pre-sales team work more efficiently. Uh, the second thing that is very well related to this is measure activities, right? Is your team working at the capacity that you would be expecting? How is the, the projection capacity for your team? Um, by now, you should be, you know, uh, Log, uh, um, analyzing the activities for your team, tracking the activities, and see where are your SEs spending their time. Um, what kind of activities do they do? How can you, uh, you know, improve them? How can you make them more efficient? How do you allocate the resources? Is it, um, you know, geographically? Is it per vertical? Um, each company is going to have their own. There isn't like a magical number for everyone. But uh, it's really important that you look at your business needs and how your team has been performing and, you know, taking actions to actually make that team more uh, efficient. Um, 
once you close those two, right, this demand gap, and you know exactly what, what your team does, uh, if you have the right number of AEs associated to your SCs, if you have the, the right capacity of activities, you know, how many opportunities they should be engaged per quarter, or, you know, what is the conversion rate that you're expecting from them, and, and things like that, then I think it's a good time for you to move on and look for the, the right people for the right positions. Um, this exercise really helps you uh, understand where, where your team is, where you want to take your team, and uh, you know, find the right profiles for, uh, to make that, that team grow, but in an efficient way, instead of having like a, an inflated team of people that are spending their times on things that they shouldn't. So I think that's the first step. But one more reason why you should be hiring is that you might have been affected by the great resignation. And that would be our, our next uh, topic. I really want to drill down into that and understand what's happening in the world today uh, uh, in terms of the great, resigna the great resignation. Um, this is a term that you must have been seeing a lot if you're in social media, if, you, if you're watching the, the news around tech, you're gonna see this expression a lot. If you work with HR, you, you're probably into it too. Um, what, is, what has been happening uh, is that uh, the, the great resignation, it's been called, been called like that because employees are actually leaving their companies nowadays. Before we had the pandemic, it was kind of easy to, you know, go to a pool of candidates and, and take the, you know, pick the people that you, you will want to be part of your team. But now it is a bit harder because there are so many opportunities out there and it's actually a, a cycle right you have more people resigning their jobs which uh you know causes uh, companies to have more openings more people then uh, start thinking about resigning their jobs they do resign and more of more opportunities open so you know it, it's a it, it's a cycle that feeds itself and it all started um, you know, with uh, as an effect of the, the pandemic. So I, I, I'm leaving some documentation for you there. I, I think that the guys at Consensus can, can share this, um, this presentation with you after, because I think it's worth looking at the articles I left there. Um, but uh, some very important things from this report is, um, first of all, this is happening globally and it's happening in all kinds of industries, uh, but mainly in health uh, and tech, right, which were, I, I think, the, the most affected uh, during the pandemic, health for obvious reasons, and tech, we had like an explosion in some verticals. Um, and, uh, you know, a, a very, very big growth uh, in terms of, you know, technologies and what people are adopting and um, consequently more opportunities in the market, more people resigning and that cycle starting. One other interesting thing is that the age range uh, of people uh, leaving their companies right now is between 30 and 45 years old. Um, one might think that uh, probably the younger ones would be the one looking for new opportunities because they're more likely to take bigger risks. But what the pandemic has caused is actually for people to, you know, analyze what's happening in their lives, how they want their careers to be. And, you know, it, it's become a very important opportunity for people to shift their careers. And these are the people that are, uh, as we could say, like in the mid-career level. So they, they, they've already experienced a lot of things and maybe they have been set on the same position for a long time and they're looking for a change or they want to spend more time with their families or they want to have some time to dedicate to personal projects. So, you know, you have a, a, a mature uh, workforce that is now in the market. So you need to be more attractive and you need to think about other things uh, to attract people, not just, you know, having that job available uh, that, uh, for example, pays well, right? This is a given, everybody wants that, right? So you, you want to, to try to um, differentiate yourself when you're hiring. Um, just so you get a dimension of, of, of everything that's happening, uh, over 4 uh, million Americans quit their jobs in 2021. I see a lot of you are, are from the US. Uh, you understand how big this number is. 
um, it, it, it's a lot of people quitting their jobs. And the reasons uh, behind that is, uh, first of all, during the pandemic, a lot of people did not change jobs because of the uncertainty. Every year, there's a percentage of the workforce that, you know, resigns and, uh, you know, go look for other opportunities. But people have delayed uh, that process. So a lot of people that would have been looking for jobs uh, during the pandemic time, the pandemic is not over, obviously, but we, we do have, you know, uh, more flexible environments at the moment, especially after the, the vaccines came out. Uh, a lot of uh, a lot of people that uh, were holding off looking for jobs when they saw, you know, the governments, uh, you know, making things a little bit more flexible, they decided to go to the market. So you have this backlog from the pandemic and you have the people that would, you know, naturally be looking for jobs right now. So you have a lot more people, you know, uh, in the market at the moment. We also have that uncertainty with the new normal. Do I have to go back to the office? Do I have to work from home? Maybe I want to spend more time with my family. Maybe um, I, I want to, you know, go back to the way things were. And sometimes people's uh, desires are not allowed, uh, allowed, aligned with the company's desires to, um, you know, uh, for example, go back to the office or, you know, roles are being reviewed and companies are restructuring. So uh, there's a lot of uncertainty and people are taking this as an opportunity to look at what is out there. Um, and another very important thing that we're gonna cover a lot during the session is the workplace culture. Right. This is very, very important because um, people adapted to working from home and um, that flexibility that that gives you is very valuable for a lot of people. Um, the whole thing about the workplace culture, it's never been so um, evident and so strong, you know, um, in all aspects, uh, the way that a leader treats their employees, the way that employees, uh, you know, uh, uh, relate to each other, the way that people feel included or not within an organization, the way that people uh, react to companies' decisions and the way that that culture is nurtured. So, you know, if you haven't adapted yet, or if you're not listening to your employees yet, you're probably being heavily affected by the, the great resignation. Um, and it's uh, now it's time to make a shift, uh, perhaps in the culture of your, uh, of your company or uh, of your teams. Um, bringing this to the pre-sales world and bringing some numbers uh, from pre-sales, this uh, actually came from the pre-sales collective. I'm leaving the link for the articles there as well. Uh, just so you get a dimension of it for pre-sales specifically, as of June the 1st uh, this year, there were more than 13,000 open jobs uh, in North America, 11,000 in EMEA, and 16,000 across APJ. That's, that's a lot of jobs, right? Um, I think that the pre-sales um, industry um, mainly, it, it, it has been changing so much in the last couple of years, and it's becoming more and more relevant. And um, there are a lot of people coming into the industry, but there's still a lot of opportunity there for everyone. So I, it's very exciting to be at pre-sales right now, um, just because we we have so many opportunities, right? Uh, as leaders or as individual contributors, there's a lot for everyone to learn there. One thing that really caught my attention is that the tenure um, has been under three years. So historically, if we look at the IT companies, um, people uh, tend uh, or tended to be for longer tenures in the uh, have longer tenures in the companies, right? Um, we all have the colleagues that you know have been working on the same company for 15, 20, 25 years. Um, but the truth is right now with a lot of people joining, uh, the industry and uh, so much movement within the industry, uh, the tenure is actually under three years. And in regions like APJ, it's even less. So, you know, we're, we're seeing that people are staying for less time in the companies and we have, you know, more rotation, especially with everything, this whole scenario that we have right now. Um, Last but not least, there, I wanted to put these numbers out there for you because I wanted to call your attention to them specifically. 
29% in North America, 21% uh, in EMEA, and 16% in APJ. Um, you might be wanting to guess what these numbers are. This is actually the amount of people that changed their jobs in the last 12 months in the pre-sales industry only. This is very, very high, right? Uh, seven out of 10 in North America. That's, that's such a, a very, a, such, such an important number uh, for us to understand how many opportunities are, are out there and how many candidates are out there for, for us to, to talk to, right? Um, so the bottom line is things have shifted. While before we, it would be much easier for us to pick candidates from a pool, now the candidates are the ones picking the, the jobs that they want. So, you know, we need to become uh, attractive and we need to prevent our own people from leaving. So uh, and that, that's when uh, I really want to drill down into culture and process, right? It's really, really important. And it's, it's key for, you know, the, uh, this whole scenario that we're seeing today. Um, if you're being affected by the rate resignation, it's really important that you quantify the problem. Look at how many people are leaving your company, you know, why they're leaving your company and develop retention programs. Um, a lot of uh, people that I've been talking to that have been uh, resigning lately, um, they always tell me that, you know, when they go to resign, the company tells them, well, what can we make, what can we do to make you stay? Is it money that you need? We'll pay you more. And usually uh, what they say to me is that, well, it's, it's not just about the money, you know, money is one component of it, but people are not just leaving for the money. Uh, People leave because they lack recognition, right? People leave because um, they, they're given uh, extra tasks and not being recognized for it. People are leaving because the, the culture of the company or the company's values are not aligned with their own values anymore. Um, people are questioning if you know the, the place where they're working is really the place where they want to be, uh, if they really want to represent that company. Uh, people are looking a lot at work-life balance, you know, uh, at flexibility, and especially in, in pre-sales, um, what the pandemic brought us and what it showed us, uh, one, uh, you know, among a, a lot of things, but one of the things is that, you know, there's a lot of things that we can do remotely. There's a lot of things that, you know, uh, we, we had to keep selling during these times, right? And um, I, I don't know uh, about all of your industries, but, uh, you know, uh, my company kept making money, uh, even though everything was so adverse uh, during this pandemic times, the, the pre sales teams adapted really quickly. And people actually got a taste of, you know, that work-life balance of having the extra hour in their day in which they're not commuting to actually do other things, to, to go to the gym, to spend more time with their kids or to, you know, spend time on, on their little personal projects or their hobbies. So people are taking that, a lot of that in, into, into consideration when looking for a new job. Leadership is really, really important. I'm going to drill down into that a little bit further because it's really important that we understand that as leaders, we have such a, a big responsibility um, to, to exercise and to practice empathy towards our teams. Um, I, 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 if there's a word that I want you to, to get, out of, uh, get out of here today is empathy. Um, it, uh, empathetic leadership is really important and uh, people are more than ever looking up to their leaders. And if you're in an environment where you're not recognized, that the culture is bad, that your leader doesn't listen to you, that, you know, uh, you're just given more tasks and, uh, you know, without recognition, you're probably looking at, uh, you know, seeking other opportunities. And honestly, all of this also reflects how the world outside sees your company, right? So it's not just retaining that people that you have in your organization, but also how the candidates are going to see you, right? I, um, I've probably been in, uh, interviewing a person that uh, actually told me that one of the reasons why they have picked uh, our company to, to join is because of 
uh, the the leadership style that they uh, uh, that they sensed from talking to me, from talking to my leaders, uh, you know, and uh, other people that interviewed that person during the process. So um, that is something that you you can't really fake, you know. It, 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 uh, people sense when there is strong and empathetic leadership uh, in the company. Um, and of course, we have compensation. Compensation is important. So we, we need to make sure that our staff is well paid, that they're happy, uh, and that they're feeling challenged uh, more than anything, right? So we as Brazil's people, we love uh, our, our challenges. So um, like I told you, I would like to drill down into empathetic leadership a little bit. Um, I'm, like uh, Garrett said, I, I'm, uh, I, I'm not a native English speaker. Uh, I speak many languages. Uh, I've seen the word empathetic and I've seen the word empathic. I don't know if it's a new as UK thing. Uh, I looked it up, but uh, it seems both of them are correct. So you're gonna see both of them in this slide. Uh, if anybody knows uh, more about English language than I do, please uh, correct me if this is not right. Um, but basically, uh, I got some information from uh, this report from Catalyst. It's published in the, the Catalyst portal. Uh, link is there as well. Uh, talking about the impact of empathetic leadership on teams, right? So empathy boosts innovation and engagement. That's the first thing, right? Um, I'll show you some numbers here. I really like, uh, you know, uh, showing statements with numbers because it makes them stronger. Uh, but as you can see there, um, the, the light red um, bar, it shows a low manager empathy, the dark red shows high manager empathy, uh, and people that have uh, managers with a higher uh, manager empathy, they experience a better ability to innovate and they're more engaged to work. That's that's just a directing fact, a direct effect of it, right? Um, empath empathic leaders can help decrease burnout. Burnout is something that you know is affecting a lot of our workforce today, and um, uh, you know these numbers uh, show women during COVID nineteen, uh, the ones that have high manager empathy. It's not like they didn't, they weren't burned out, but they were less burned out than the ones that have bosses that have low empathy. Um, empathic leaders re uh, respect employees' life circumstances. I think we're all experiencing this with COVID, right? If you have a, a, a leader that shows empathy, they will respect uh, your life circumstances when things come your way, when you have a relative that is sick or when you need to you know, work from somewhere else to take care of somebody or you know, when you need to work and take care of your kids at the same time. So uh, empathic managers uh, that support life work needs, uh, you know, people have a better feeling of, you know, being able to balance life work demands, you know, and when we talk about life work demands, it's, it, it can't be too much about life, it can't be too much about work, it has to be a balance. And when you have empathic leadership, uh, you experience that more often. Uh, empathic leaders foster inclusive employee experiences, as you may have already realized, uh, inclusion, diversity, equity. This is something, is a topic that is very dear to me. And uh, if you look at these numbers, comparing men and women, uh, of course, we're missing some other genders there, but looking at men and women for this particular study, um, the way that they feel included when there's low manager empathy, Women, uh, you know, the, the number for women is very low. As you can see there in blue, only 9% experience, experience inclusion and 22% of men. But when you have leaders that show high empathy, look at the numbers. The both bars go up to 42%. So not only they're higher, they're more equal, right? So that says a lot um, in terms of, uh, you know, you can extrapolate that not just between men and women, but you know, men and women, people of different races, people of different backgrounds, origins, and age, right? Um, 
senior leader empathy predicts lower intent to leave. So that's what happens. Uh, if you look at all of this, you see that the empathetic leadership, it has so many things um, uh, that, that you know, are good for the employees. Um, they will feel less likely to leave, right? So the numbers uh, there, they talk about women of color and their intent to leave. And uh, when you have a low uh, senior leader empathy, uh, that number is much higher than uh, when you when you don't when you have high right. So um, I, I, this is very very important because it reflects on everything else, right? When it comes to retaining and uh, acquiring talent, okay. Um, I, I, I feel uh, compelled to talk just a little bit further about culture and DEI. Um, and when I talk about DEI, I, I don't want you to think only about gender matters, right? I want you to think about gender, but also race, uh, about uh, origins, you know, where people come from, about religion, about age differences, right? So at the same time that we need to give uh, equal opportunities for younger people, you know, they're just starting in the industry. We also need to value our senior uh, professionals in the market. It's not about prioritizing one group on top of the other, but giving opportunities for everybody to, you know, have the same opportunities, right? When you're recruiting and when people join your team, make sure that um, everyone around them is educated to, treat them as equals and have them feel like they can be themselves uh, within your organization. Uh, that's the whole thing about DEI. It's not prioritizing uh, some over others, but to make everybody feel like they can be themselves in your organization. Um, that's something that I personally value a lot. When I'm looking at new opportunities, I would uh, definitely prioritize companies that have a strong um, DEI, uh, you know, culture uh, within the organization. So that's another thing to keep in mind. So, well, we've been through all of this, right? We analyzed the great resignation. We talked about culture. We talked about the reasons why people leave. Uh, we talked about, you know, why you should hire in the first place. So now to the more practical things, where to find talent, right? Where are these people for me to hire, right? So I, I think that uh, what I wanted to do is this, in the session is to uh, have you open your minds a little bit because the market is very competitive right now. And you're probably going to have to look at places where you traditionally wouldn't look at. So the first thing, expand from your traditional sources, right? Usually when we're going to hire, we're going to look at, you know, our competitors, people in our customers, maybe our contractors, maybe people in our most, uh, our closest network on the same vertical or the same industry. Try to expand, you know, expand the age range, expand the, uh, you know, uh, the geographically, uh, if you can expand, uh, you know, your network, look for people in, in other uh, industries, right? So uh, try to not uh, stick to the, the, your traditional sources. It's very important that you look in different places and look for different profiles that, you know, you're usually, um, uh, that, that you're usually hiring or, or different profiles from what you have in your uh, current team. Um, one very important thing about building diverse teams with people from different backgrounds is that everybody is more productive when the team is diverse. So expand from your traditional resources. Uh, Pre-sales specifically, we have uh, a set of skills that uh, are very hard to teach Right, um, we're, and we're going to go over the skills in in the next section. Uh, but you know, products or or characteristics of a vertical, things like that. These things can be um, taught in a more uh, in an easier way than some other skills. So be open for people coming from different industries or from different backgrounds. Um, look within uh, pre-sales or SE communities, you know, like the, the pre-sales collective, like the, the scaling pre-sales uh, group from consensus. Um, I feel like recently, in the, you know, in the past couple of years, 
pre-sales are like finding themselves and communities are being built. There, uh, if, you, if you just uh, Google uh, pre-sales communities, you're gonna find uh, many options that you can look at. Be part of these communities, right? And I think it's really important for both leaders and uh, individual contributors to be part of a community of pre-sales not just to take things from it and learn from it, but also as an opportunity to give back, right? Um, like I said in the beginning, I, I have more than 15 years of experience uh, working with pre-sales. Um, I, I think it's uh, a, a part of, uh, you know, my values and everything just to give back to the community. Uh, you know, if I can contribute with my knowledge, that's what makes me happy as a pre-sales person, right? So you're gonna find uh, very good people within the pre-sales communities. Expand profiles, expand age, experience, industry. Like I said before, don't go look in the same places, look in different places, go to the communities and expand the profiles that, uh, that you're looking at, right? Look for different people. Um, I've just, um, I, I, I was, I ju I've just been through a process hiring a person for my team. Um, and this person comes from, from a, comp well, almost a completely different industry. It's still in IT infrastructure, but it's a completely different world. Um, it's a person that has a background on development and things like that. So he's a tacky, but he has all the pre-sales skills, work, you know, a person with experience in sales, in development, in other things, and turns out to be a very good pre-sales profile. So, you know, you can make a bet on somebody that, you know, has a different background uh, and are trying to move into the, the pre-sales world. Uh, you can, uh, you know, look for people that are coming from other industries uh, or people that, you know, are seniors, you know, they have a lot to contribute with their experience. And if they're eager to learn, um, uh, you, you're, you're definitely going to have a, a good, uh, a good person for your, uh, for your team and expand the profiles. You know, uh, in the past, we used to talk to think about pre-sales people as being that uh, technical guy that goes with sales to, you know, help sell a product. And what we see today is that pre-sales, uh, in pre-sales, we have all these different profiles and, uh, from, uh, you know, the, the, the thing that customers are looking for and the, the easiest way to, to sell today is when you become a trusted advisor to the customer. So that requires uh, a set of skills and, uh, you know, a, a kind of profile that might not be the traditional pre-sales guy that we used to look at in the past. So maybe we don't, we're not looking for somebody who's highly technical, but this person has other skills that are going to help, you know, them become a trusted advisor uh, and sell my product. Ultimately, you could have a, a team of architects or PMs that can support that person. Um, but, you know, uh, it's really important to try to break this um, uh, th this paradigms that we have within pre-sales uh, and, and expand the profiles that we have. And, you know, uh, Leslie, hire someone internally. Um, well, I've once uh, hired for my, my team in pre-sales, someone that came from, from the technical support team. And uh, she's doing really well until today, you know, uh, that, that product knowledge you can build and, uh, you know, people can learn. Um, if they have a little bit of that, uh, what I call the pre-sales sparkle that, you know, uh, eager to, to help others and to solve customers' problems, um, you're already, uh, you know, in, in the good path. So give opportunity to someone internally, start preparing them, start giving them training uh, and make that transition with them into pre-sales. So these are some topics. Uh, or, or suggestions for you where to find talent. And, uh, you know, now that you know how you can expand and, and how you can find more talent, uh, I want to share with you the key skills uh, I look for in an SE. So when I'm hiring, what are the things that I look for in an SE more than just product knowledge, right? Product knowledge is important. It helps a lot. Uh, within the learning process, right? Within the learning curve, when you just hired a, a pre-sales uh, consultant or an SE. Um, 
but there are other skills for me that are really, really important as well. And that those are the skills we should be looking for. So first of them, the business acumen, you know, that person needs to be able to identify uh, what are the, the motivations for the customer? You know, what is going to be good for their business? Being able to build rapport, being able to build that relationship with the customer. Um, that's, a, that's a very, very important skill. Selling skills uh, is also really, really important, you know, and being outgoing and knowing how to talk to customers uh, and, you know, uh, be good at active listening, you know, pay attention to what the customer is telling you and being able to translate that into uh, something that's going to be good to the customer and the customer can understand the value of that. Uh, and that's a very attached to communication and presentation skills. Um, I could do a 10 minute or a three hour product uh, presentation and I would bore you to death, but you know, um, the, uh, what is really important when you're a pre sales uh, or an SC uh, is that you present something in uh, telling a story in a way that makes sense, that people can relate to it, that people can see themselves in that situation. Um, and then, you know, um, give them a purpose in, in that in that presentation or that demo or, uh, you know, make a valuable use of their time. Uh, relationship building skills, active listening. Uh, these are things that I, I usually evaluate as well. And the person has to be innovative, curious, eager to learn because, you know, you're not going to find the perfect candidate. You're not going to find somebody that ticks all the boxes and know your products and, you know, know uh, everything. But if they have a few of those skills, um, if they have, uh, you know, a a bit of a background on what you're looking for, or maybe they don't have your product background, but they do have very strong um, skills like these ones. You know, it's important that that person is willing to learn, that that person is willing to change, that the person is willing to innovate. And what I really like to do with, with my teams is, uh, you know, um, build that confidence in them so they can do their, their jobs, uh, you know, consistently and, and in an autonomous way. Um, I'm not the kind of uh, leader like looking at every single thing they do and uh, basically micromanaging them. Uh, but I really like to um, encourage them to try new things, to innovate, to participate on communities, to go to the market and to bring new things that are gonna make the work better for everyone. So I'm looking for people that show me those qualities uh, and, and that are eager to learn, because of course, then that's easier uh, for us to to shape their their profile to what we need uh, within the team. So, um, yeah, uh, this uh, this would be uh, in a nutshell uh, what I would uh, would recommend. Um, there is a very very nice book out there. I really recommend you taking a look a look at it, which is the. Um, uh, I don't remember the exact name. It's um, the the solutions engineer, the SE manager handbook. Um, I will look it up, guys, and and I'll I'll paste it for you, Garrett. If you uh, if you know the one I'm talking about, uh, by by John Kerr, um, that's a really good one. There are very nice tips there for you uh, about retention and um, and uh, recruitment as well. So. Um, yeah, um, I will open up for, for questions. Um, Garrett? Yeah, thank you so much, Amanda. Um, let me get my video back on here. Uh, let me pull up the one that's online. So one that came in from uh, John Rainwater says, one of our hiring practices is to have candidates DOA, um, so sorry, do a technical challenge. Uh, to make sure they can do some basic things with our products, our HR slash recruiting team is telling us that tech challenges are going away in the market and we need to stop doing them. What are your thoughts about tech challenges for candidates? I, I, I kind of agree with your HR team. <laughs> um, I think that there are other ways that you can actually uh, try to, to sense the, 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 the person's knowledge um, on 
not exactly your products, but maybe your vertical or your industry. Um, uh, products is something that, that you know, can be taught. And uh, of course that could impact the learning curve. Um, but I think that uh, again, if the, the person has that eager to learn, if they have all these other skills that make a good pre-sales professional, um, you will be able to teach them uh, uh, products, you know. Um, uh, tech challenges are, um, uh, I think they would make more sense for positions that require a stronger uh, technical um, usage, like, uh, I don't know, a solutions architect or, you know, uh, somebody more related to, to, to product functionality. The thing is today, the customers don't wanna hear about uh, product functionality. They want to hear about you know, the solutions. And um, it also, it of course, depends on the way that your company is structured, but you could have a backline team to support the guys that are probably not that uh, technical, but that can sell the solution to the customers um, you know, from a technical standpoint. Very cool. um, yep. So here's another one that came on. What is your strategy to stop unconscious bias in the recruiting process from HR and talent recruitment? I love this question. Thank you so much. Um, this, uh, uh, I think that the key for uh, breaking unconscious bias is, is education. It, it's, it's a lot of education. You need to have the buy-in from your executive teams. Uh, you know, you need to have uh, this, uh, you need to have a program to make people aware of that throughout your organization. You know, it's really, really important. Um, I'm, I'm actually leading a, a DEI team uh, at ArcServe as well. And it, it is a struggle because a lot of people think that the unconscious bias is not there and you need to educate them to it, you know, with a lot of care. It's not just throwing things at people's faces, but um, it, it's showing them how, uh, you know, how that affects other people. Because when you're not part uh, of a particular min minorized group, uh, sometimes it's really hard to put yourself in their, in their shoes, right? So I think that education there is key. Love it. Um... How do you, this is one that, that I thought of as a, that came to mind for me as I was going through this with you is how do you build internal interest um, from, to, for, to build some of your candidate pool? Um, you know, do you put on activities or workshops or, you know, like get to know what sales engineering is? I mean, so how, how do you, how do you gauge that interest and get people to, uh, from your own company to want to make a shift into your org? I, I think that it has to do with internal communication, um, you know, uh, mostly, uh, you know, it, it's showing, I think that it's really important when people share internally their, you know, um, uh, how teams are being recognized and the good things that people are doing. So, you know, even though, for example, I'm, I, I don't have much to do with order processing, but if I know about their, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, how they're being recognized and uh, what the nice things that they're doing and how they're, uh, the, the good contribution they're making to the company, that might compel me to, you know, uh, look at that team and, and wanting to learn more about it or even join it, you know? So I think that uh, internal communication is key for that. And, um, you know, uh, that also helps people feel recognized, you know, to see their, uh, you know, that what they're doing is being shared internally and um, that people are appreciating what they're doing. Awesome. And then a couple of things about sourcing and finding people. So outside of LinkedIn, this is from Trey Griego, outside of LinkedIn, um, where are some places where you could source good talent? Look, I've personally been using the, the pre-sales communities a lot, you know, uh, because it, you have a lot of people that you, you can, you know, connect with there. And usually they have ch specific channels for, for jobs. Um, also, if you're looking for, uh, for candidates and, and, you know, you post it in the community, maybe someone knows someone who, uh, you know, would be a good fit for the job. So out of LinkedIn, I've been using the communities a lot. Okay. Um, and outside of the communities, as a follow-up to that, what are some of the industries that you've noticed uh, can give you really good um, potential SEs? 
Um, that, that varies a lot depending on the, the pre-sales profile that you're looking for. Um, I, I think that um, that's going to vary depending on your company. Um, that, that due diligence that you have to, to do, uh, uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, you know, the why hire, that is going to help you define the, the profile that you're looking for and therefore where you're going to look for these people. Because if you need a uh, uh, a pre-sales person that is more, uh, is highly technical, uh, you're probably going to be looking at, you know, communities that are more focused on the technical uh, uh, aspects of, uh, of the solutions. And from there, you can form someone as an SE, you can help them become an SE. Or if you're uh, working with a specific vertical a specific industry vertical, uh, uh, you might be wanting to look at communities for that particular vertical. So, um, and if you're looking for someone who is more of a generalist, then you would uh, definitely, uh, you can definitely broaden your search, you know, and, and go look in the, the pure pre-sales communities. And it's easier to shift people from different, um, from in, uh, different industries within uh, tech. Um, if they're generalists, right? Because they're not attached to a vertical or they're not highly technical on something. Uh, so all of these profiles, they have their pros and cons, you know, for the uh, the, uh, the individual contributor. But uh, I think that that uh, initial work that you have to do uh, to decide why you want to hire, that's really important to actually to find a profile that you're looking for. Okay, great, love it. Uh, next one comes from Duncan, and he says salaries are very competitive, even for remote jobs. How do you work around this challenge? Like I said, people don't leave the companies uh, just for salaries, right? And they don't join companies just for salaries. Uh, I, I've I've heard recent stories of uh, colleagues that decided to go to, uh, you know, they had two offers in their hands, one with, uh, you know, that pays a lot of money, but the culture of the company is not so good. Uh, and, uh, you know, another one with a salary that wasn't as good as the other one, but the company shows a great culture and they, they have uh, DEI programs and they um, do uh, activities with their teams and they seem to be very happy there. So they ended up going to, you know, less money, more culture than, you know, more money, less culture. It depends on what you're looking for, right? But people tend to be happier when they have... Uh, a couple of those components that we were discussing before, right? Recognition, culture, flexibility, uh, leadership, and pay, all right? So it's not just about money. Yeah. yeah. And from a retention point of view, what are some of your techniques for SE recognition beyond, you know, the email shout outs that happen? Uh, uh, that, that's that's a, a really important one as well. Uh, I think it's... Um, uh, working with your team on their personal development plans and you know having uh, them have clear metrics and and things that actually challenge them that can uh, allow you to do the proper recognition for them make them available uh, eligible for uh, a, a pay raise even though that's that shouldn't be the only way you should be recognizing your team um, but you know, I think that people really value the fact uh, that they are part of a team, that they're respected in that team, um, and that they can, um, uh, that, you know, I, I have one of, one of the guys in my team that his favorite competition is against himself. So he's uh, the kind of person that, uh, you know, if he sees his metrics and he sees he's beating himself last year, that's the recognition that he's looking for. And that's the challenge that, that he seeks. So it, it goes to, uh, you know, building that relationship with the people that report to you and working on, because, you know, what might work as recognition for me might not be the same as it does for you. So I think it comes down to the, to the leadership to, to define, but there are different ways that you can recognize people. Definitely, I love it. Great mm -hmm. strategies, uh, both on a personal and team level. Um, going back to working with your leadership team and just a company culture as a whole, do you have any strategies that you've seen effective for holding people accountable to their unconscious biases? That is, um, that, that, uh, that's an interesting, a hard question, but it's it's worth talking about it because we don't want to 
impose things to people, but at the same time, we don't want to feed those unconscious bias. Sometimes people don't realize they have them. Um, I think that holding them accountable is more of the process of educating them uh, and making them see where their uh, uh, where their unconscious bias is coming up uh, coming up. And it's very delicate because you you might offend someone depending on how you bring that up to them. So um, again, education is key on that. And the way that you're going to approach people with that is more of, you know, trying to show them um, where that bias is, then, um, you know, um, I, I'm, I'm looking for a better word, but I'll just use the, the bad one anyway, I'll punishing them for, you know, having an unconscious bias, because we all have it, we all have them. And, uh, you know, awareness is, is everything on this, because, um, you know, as a woman in IT, uh, I have reproduced uh, throughout my career many, many times, uh, many of the, the male behaviors uh, towards other women that I didn't understand until they were shown to me, you know. Uh, in fact, there's a, an interesting data that says that uh, you know, be, just because I, I work with uh, self self promotion on my on my personal uh, time, um, most of uh, uh, a lot of people perceive badly women who self promote, and most of that feedback actually comes from other women. You know, so uh, you know it, it's um, it's it's a very delicate subject, and uh, I think it's it's very related to awareness. You have to show where the bias is. Uh, but you have to do it with care. You have to show empathy and understand that not everybody is mm, deconstructed uh, in terms of their biases. Definitely. Uh, I think we have time for one, maybe two more. Uh, here's a really interesting yeah. one from Phil Davies. He asks, do you think the pandemic has made the SE career less attractive, making it harder for SEs to be on site and strategic with customers?